Greetings and welcome to Probability of Probabilities Part 3. I'm Alan Bell and I'll be stepping you through this presentation uh, as a follow on to the first two parts which are available elsewhere on YouTube. Let me start by giving credit where credit is due and providing you with the reference you need if you want to go see the first two uh, chapters in this video presentation series. Three blue, one brown is uh, something you can easily search for. When you find their site on YouTube, just look at their video playlists and you'll find one called Probability of Probabilities. It's a three-part series, but conspicuously absent is part three of that series. Uh, the part two was published over two years ago and uh, looking at the comments, there are a lot of folks who've been waiting a long time for the answer to some of the questions that were posed in the first two parts. So I've taken it upon myself to try and answer those. Here's the problem that was set up in part two of the video series. And essentially what you see is a series of 10 coin flips. And the issue at hand is that the coin is not necessarily a fair coin. We have no idea what the probability of heads might be. The original videos, the first two parts, start to set this problem up as a Bayes theorem problem. And if you knew or you had some prior belief in the probability of heads, you might be able to go that route and you might be able to declare what you think the probability of heads is, whatever that prior probability might be. And then you could consider this an experiment with a result. And you could essentially use Bayes' theorem to ask the question, how does the result of this test update my belief in the probability of heads? But we don't have that prior probability, at least not from the presentation that was uh, developed prior to this one. And so I've taken a different approach to come up with a solution. And essentially the objective here is just to ask ourselves, what can we say about the probability of heads given only this experiment, 10 coin flips of which seven came up heads? As you trace through part two, this is a snapshot from the very end or very close to the end. And you can see that after a number of theoretical explanations, we get to a point where the author has said, we really aren't able to come up with a single probability of heads. The best we can hope for is to come up with the probability of heads lying between two probabilities. And this is because he's developed this probability density function um, but notice that while the probability along the bottom of this graph goes from zero to one, as all probabilities do, <clears throat> another thing that is conspicuously absent are the units on the left side, that vertical axis. There's nothing there. So let us move on. And what I've done is I've recreated that function that you saw on the previous page, but I've created it as a probability mass function. This is a discrete function, but I've chosen so many samples that the little bars in there start to create the same picture that you saw with the density function. The other thing to notice is that this graph does have units on that left side. And with those, we can start to answer the question that you see on the top right. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to transition out of PowerPoint and move into Excel so I can show you exactly how I approach this problem. And I'd invite you to share any criticisms you have, especially if I've made any errors along the way, uh, or other ideas. There may be other approaches to solving this problem and coming up with an answer to it. All right, so what we have is just a blank spreadsheet, just the stock version of Excel without any add-ons or anything. And what I've done is I've just set up a spreadsheet so that I can take the information that I know for sure and Put that on the page to start with. So I just created a little table here for the number of successes. In this case, we have seven heads. We'll call that the success case. And we had 10 trials. So nothing uncertain about those. But the probability, that is a question. So the approach I'm going to take to this is I'm going to essentially uh, use another table over here where I've started at zero. And I've run this all the way down a thousand rows till I get to one. Uh, in increments of one in a thousand. And the way I'm going to treat this is I'm going to treat this column here as a series of hypotheses. And so to start with, this one's relatively simple because if I 
state a hypothesis that the probability of heads, that underlying probability is zero, then of course it wouldn't be possible for heads to occur at all, not even once, let alone seven times. So we know what the outcome would be, but the way we answer the question for certain is to use the binomial distribution. It's coded up into Excel for us. So if we just start typing binom, you'll see it in there, binomial distribution. Hit the tab key and it gives, I know there's a really small, but it gives us a little tool tip and it asks me for the number of successes. So I'll just reference that cell, lock it down with some anchors because I'm gonna reuse it in a minute. And then the same thing with the number of trials. So I'll lock that down as well. And then it wants to know the probability of success. And at this point, this is my hypothesis, which is just in the cell off to the left here, it's zero. Lastly, it's gonna ask me, do I want the CDF or the PMF? And I want the latter. So now I can just grab this and I can run it all the way down to the bottom and I can fill down. And if I go back up to the top, with all those numbers highlighted, I can insert a graphic to help you see what this looks like. And right away, you can see that distinctive shape that we saw in the video and even in the presentation that I put together. So, what this is though, this is not a density function. And one of the things that will tell you it's not a density function right away is that we have the law of total probability that says that if this was a curve, then the area under this curve would have to be equal to exactly one, and it's not. You can see by these numbers over here, these are some pretty large numbers, and there's just no way. It's gonna be substantially higher than one. So this is not uh, a density function, which is kind of what we're looking for. And instead though, what I can do is I can try to take these numbers that are, are not really useful to us right now, and I can try to change these into something that would be. In other words, if I can figure out what numbers go over here on the left that would create a situation where the probability under this curve is exactly one, then I'd be in business. So how might I approach that? And remember, even though this looks like a continuous function, it really isn't. This is based on the binomial, which is a discrete probability distribution. And so that leads me to come down here and just put a little equation in saying, I'm going to sum together all of these probabilities from C7 to C1007. And it gives us a really interesting result, one that you probably would not have guessed uh, intuitively. But I think this winds up being one of the keys that's gonna allow us to answer the question at hand. So with this being in cell C1008, let me go back up to the top and just enter something like this. Total probability is whatever is in C1008. Just so it's a little bit easier uh, to find it. And so what I'm gonna do now, because this really isn't uh, a density function, it certainly is not, it really isn't uh, the PMF that I'm looking for either. And so what I'm gonna do just to distinguish here is I'm gonna call this a pseudo PMF. And in order to get what I'm really looking for, which is something that I think is a more useful uh, tool, I'm gonna just take each one of these and I'm going to divide whatever happens to be in that distribution by the total probability. Again, I'll lock it down with some anchors. I'll grab this and I'll drag it all the way to the bottom. Fill down. And when I come back here, what you'll see is I can insert another bar graph. And it looks almost exactly like the first one, especially if I stretch it out to the same size. But notice that the units on the left are substantially different now. And I think we're in business at this point. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete the original graphic because we don't really need it anymore. More of just for a demonstration of how to get to this point. And the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna select the probability data because I really want this to go from zero to one. So let me grab all of this. Okay, okay, so that should give me a, a little bit more, 
a little closer to what I'm looking for. And so now what I'm thinking is that if I were to draw a curve to outline this shape that we see right here, and especially if I could come up with an equation to describe that curve, then I would really have something. Because what I could do is I could integrate that equation and that would take me from a density function into a cumulative distribution function. But I really don't want to get involved with that kind of calculus, especially since we're dealing with uh, something that is essentially it's a fundamentally a discrete problem. So let me do this. Let me zoom out just a little bit and move this over. And what I want to do is I now want to create a CDF, but I can't really use the internal functionality of Excel right now because it'll give me something that I'm not looking for. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to take sort of our knowledge of what a CDF is and I'm going to build one manually. So I'm just going to say it starts at zero because there's nothing, nothing below that. And then from here on out, I'm going to have whatever I, I just had it above it and I'm going to add whatever the contribution is uh, to the left. And then I'm going to take this and as we've done before, drag it all the way to the bottom. And no surprise, every cumulative distribution goes from zero to one. So we now have something that we can probably use. Let me highlight this because I want to create a graphic of this as well. Come back here. Let's use another bar graph. And for consistency, let's try to match these up in terms of size. And I'll put one on top of the other so you can see that typical relationship that we often see between the PMF and the CDF. As I did before, let me select the data as quickly as I can. Again, from zero down to one. And now we have the tools that we need. We have both the PMF and uh, the CDF. And this second tool is really gonna be the one that's gonna allow us to answer the questions. So with that, let me go back into the presentation and see how we apply these. Specifically, what we want to know is what's the probability that the probability of heads lies between these two boundaries? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this PMF with the CDF that we just created. But I'm going to do the same thing. I want to know what the different what the probability is to start with, that my probability, the one I'm looking for, is less than or equal to 0.8. And I can do that using this CDF very easily. All I do is I go to 0.8 and I come up this line until I intersect my curve or what appears to be a curve. And then I come over here to the side and I see where it intersects this axis. And it happens that it turns out to be about 0.84. It's a tiny little rounding error there, but it's close enough for our work. So now what I want to do is I'm going to do the exact same thing again at 0.6. And I want to see what the probability is that it's going to be less than that number. And this hopefully is, is familiar to you uh, as how we use this CDF. If I want to know the area or the probability in between these two numbers, I just take this one, the 84%, I just subtract out what is to the left of this line, and it leaves me with the probability I'm looking for in between. So we can now answer that question. What's the probability that heads lies between 0.6 and 0.8? It's about 54 and a quarter percent. Okay, so there's one other question that was presented in part two of the three blue video series, and it's the one that you see on the screen here. If we have a factory building cars, 100 cars roll off the assembly line and we find defects in two of them, what can we say about the probability of a defect? If you took the time to develop a spreadsheet the way that I did, 
This is as simple as changing the number of successes to two and the number of trials to 100. And what you'll find is everything will automatically update, including the graphics. And this is what it would look like. So this gives us some immediate intuition about where the probability lies. And if we use the CDF again, exactly the same way we did when we sort of knew we wanted to look from 0.8 to 0.6, now what we can do is we can go from 97.5 to 2.5, and we can kind of see where those uh, numbers fall out. And that's what I've done to just come up with a confidence interval, uh, basic statistics here. And now what I can say is that I think the probability of a defect lies somewhere between 0.6% and 6.9%. Of course, you could change that confidence interval and then those underlying defect rates would also update as well. And if we change the sample size, uh, all of those things uh, that we learn in statistics are gonna come back and, and play into this and it'll change our results. But at least we have a handy tool now where we can answer a question about the coin flip or we can answer a question about defects in cars or any other uh, situation that comes up that essentially has the same criteria that these questions do. All right, that's all I have for you today. I hope the information was helpful to you. I encourage you to go and look at the other two videos in this series uh, on our friend's website, the three blue, one brown, as well as a lot of the other videos they have. There's some really talented folks over there and uh, there's a lot to be learned on that site. If you have any comments, uh, questions, feedback, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, post a comment below. And uh, I hope the information's been useful to you.